In this video, we are going to talk about algorithms. This is primarily aimed at key stage 4, but it's applicable for all key stages. So the key topics that we're going to look at are computational thinking in algorithms, key components of an algorithm, representation of an algorithm, and we'll look at some searching and sorting algorithms. Computational thinking. Uh, this is the key to any problem solving methodology and this is defined as a timeless and transferable skill that will enable you to think more clearly and logically as a way to solve any specific problems. Why do we need to know about computational thinking? Only when we know exactly how to actually solve a problem, we can instruct a computer or program a computer to actually do it for us. Otherwise, computers are not going to solve the problems for us automatically. So we are going to learn about how to do the problem solving by ourselves and how to automate it to enable the computers help us in solving the problem quickly and efficiently. The four components of computational thinking are decomposition, abstraction, pattern recognition and algorithms. Decomposition. We have heard this term in biology most of the time when we talk about decomposition of a body or any kind of living things, even non-living things actually rot. So what happens during those decomposition process? It breaks down into smaller particles. So that is what decomposition is all about. It's the same in computational thinking aspect too. So it is a process of taking a bigger and a very complex problem and breaking it down into smaller parts. So the problem that we have now is to find a vaccine or a preventive medicine or a cure for COVID-19. So we cannot start it by just looking at the virus and wondering what to do. We have to break it down into smaller particles and we say, okay, now they have extracted the strain of COVID-19 so now we know how the DNA of the COVID-19 looks like and then they think about how it reacts with various medicines and then they would test it for every single medicinal process that they have and use it to find a cure. And after that, probably they will also test more to see what the patterns are, how does it actually develop and find a prevention mechanism for the same. So we decompose a bigger problem into smaller parts and then try to solve each small part, in turn, solving the bigger problem. Uh, we have already talked about a real life scenario at the moment. It also applies in simpler things like cooking. When you're gonna bake a cake, like if you, if you watch, or even, even if you don't bake a cake, if you watch, uh, if you like watching Great British Bake Off, uh, during the challenge, they give the contestants a set of instructions which are broken down into you have to do this first, this is the icing part, so they are all separately mentioned, they are broken down into, into separate parts. So that helps them actually uh, do the um, baking in a very effective way. Abstraction. Abstraction is a process of removing unnecessary detail from a complex problem and making it easier to understand. For example, let's say um, you use a Google map to travel from A to B and Google Maps is giving you all the instructions. It doesn't tell you about every single strand of grass or tree or rock that you would find on the way. It takes away all those unnecessary information. It doesn't give you every single house that you will encounter when you're driving by. What it tells you is the route that you need to take. So it focuses on the problem that you need to drive from A to B and it needs to tell you the various routes that you can take, it gives you an option. It, it actually excludes all other under, like unnecessary information from the instructions. So that is called abstraction. We use it a lot uh, in day-to-day in -day life, except we don't realize it. For example, if you are gonna learn driving, um, soon or soon enough you will be taught how to uh, drive a car safely 
but you won't be taught the intricate parts of how a car is made because you don't need to know that. But if you are an engineer and you are building cars, then the outlook changes. There you have to know how, like, what each part means and how they are assembled and stuff like that. So based on the context or based on the problem, you are abstracted from all the unnecessary details. In teaching, uh, the teachers actually, for example, if you're doing a GCSE, the things that you would learn, for example, an atom or a plant cell, for example, you will not learn all the aspects of all the components of a, a plant cell or an atom. What you will learn is very important parts of it. But then when you go to the next level, A level, or even if you pursue bachelor's degree or master's in it, the uh, the amount of details that goes into every single thing that you will learn will increase because you're going to learn more in context information. So you'll be exposed to more data. So why do they not teach you those in GCSEs? Because in GCSE age group, you don't need to know that much. There is no use of you having that information at that point of time. So that's why they are all abstracted. Pattern recognition. It is a process of identifying similarities. So you, now we have broken down all the uh, big problem into smaller chunks. Now, if you see a pattern among those smaller chunks, you can group them together and solve them at the same time, or at least solve them enough to be able to use it, um, at least use a part of the solution on all these smaller problems. What happens there is it helps you solve it more efficiently and effectively and faster. So that's the reason you need to know the patterns that you have in your decomposed tasks. And the last one is the algorithms. So it is a set of instructions that are done in a certain order to solve a problem. I like asking this question about if you go to a particular place, um, say a park, you are given a set of instructions. Say, don't uh, let your dogs without the leads or don't walk on the grass, don't uh, pluck the flowers, etc, etc. These are also instructions, but they do not form an algorithm because they are not aimed at solving a problem. They are instructions to maintain the neatness of the garden or the park. Even in schools, you will be given instructions to ensure your uh, the whole school behaves as one. But it's not aimed at solving a particular problem. We use algorithms all the time in everyday life. For example, here is a very simple example of how to make and eat a toast. You start, you get two slices of bread, you put the two slices of bread in toaster, Turn on the toast and wait until it's finished. Take out the two slices of toast, spread the butter on the slices of toast and eat toast. Well, one of the students uh, in, in a school asked, why can't you just butter the toast before you put it into the toaster? Well, if your toaster can handle it or if you're using a grill, it can. So, that, so the algorithm changes. It's also important to note that to solve a particular problem, you will not have just one algorithm. You will not have one type of solution. You may have more than one algorithms to solve a problem. It's, it, it depends on the individual, it depends on the context. So algorithm is, is a set of, it's, it's plainly a set of instructions that are used to solve a problem. What kind of instruction? For example, making a cup of tea. There are 10 ways of making a cup of tea. We also have an ISO standard, as one of my friends pointed out, to make a cup of tea. So if you really wanted to follow an ISO standard way of making a cup of tea, that may not give you your preferred type of tea, but it will give you a tea. So again, algorithms are very specific to a particular problem and how you want them solved, whether you want it faster or efficiently, because not all algorithms which are faster are efficient. Uh, there are a few things that you have to remember when you're doing the algorithms. It has to be simple. So if you're going to instruct someone to do it, for example, our key uh, objective here is to be able to use all these strands of computational thinking and automate it so that the computers can do it for us. So if you're going to give it to a computer, it has to be simple instructions. You cannot give complicated because first of all, you have to teach the computer what a single instruction is. So if you give it a complicated instruction which it doesn't know, it's not going to do anything for you. So keep it simple. Give the instructions in the right order. 
So you cannot pour a hot water in a cup if you haven't actually boiled the kettle. So obviously the order is very, very important. Unambiguous. It has to be clear. Unambiguity means it, it should not be misinterpreted in any other way. So it, it has to be clear and concise instruction. And it has to be relevant to solving the problem. If you see this, you have start, drink tea, then it says put on hat. Uh, is it relevant to the problem? No, it isn't. And it also says make tea, but you're drinking it before you can make it. So the sequence, the relevancy to the problem and simple instructions are all very, very, very important in an algorithm. So any problem solving, we need to identify the steps using the strands. So first and foremost, take away all the unimportant details from the problem. When someone tells you, I want a solution for this, 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 they might give you a whole paragraph of things that they feel are important to you to solve the problem. But you don't have to take every single line of every single word that they say. Take away only the key things that will enable you to solve the problem. Then break them down into smaller tasks and find out if these smaller tasks have a pattern. And then you find an algorithm where you can solve each of these tasks separately and in turn solving the bigger problem. So go by abstraction, decomposition, pattern recognition and algorithms. For example, here we say uh, teachers use abstraction, as I told you, it's about the animal cell. And we have, so this is, the, the one on the right is what you will see when you're learning animal cells or biology in A-level and your bachelor's degree. What you need to know so far is only this. Why do we have to learn about algorithms? So, yes, we know what they are. We, we are used to solving problems. We are aiming to do it through automation. So for that, there are a few steps which will help you achieve that in a better way. You could, like if I ask, if you know how to solve a problem, for example, if you know how to do a scratch program, I, 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 I ask you to get me um, a game in scratch, you might be able to do it without even thinking about anything else. But what you might end up doing is, you might be rewriting a lot of code without knowing and you might be creating a lot of problems because you haven't thought about how the steps are going to be. You will spend a lot of time fixing your code because you haven't gone through these four steps. So what these four steps help you to do it is to write a particular game or a particular automated software in a better way and in a way that you can actually do it efficiently and effectively. So there are a few components of an algorithm that we need to know because we use it in every single algorithm one way or the other. Not all of them will be used but at least one or two of them will be used for sure. Sequence. A sequence as it says is an action or event which leads to the next ordered action in the predetermined order. As we saw earlier you need to start and then you get two slices of bread so all these have to be in a particular sequence. So you can't do one without the other. You cannot go to put the two slices of bread in toaster without getting a toast, um, a toaster and two slices of bread. So you need to be in a particular sequence and you know that after putting the slices of bread in the toaster, you have to turn it on. So if I give you this instruction or if I give a student or, or a kid or my niece, for example, to actually get me a toast, she should just follow this step by step and she should be able to get me a toast. Or get herself a toast for example this is another example here we have uh, like if I want to find out how much like what what your age will be in two years I just get your age and add two to it and I'll know that in two years you will be a particular age again another cup of coffee this may not be how your cup of coffee would look like but this is a way of making a cup of coffee. Again, there might be slight changes. People might add milk or sugar before or after. All those things changes. As we said, there are more than one ways to do a particular problem solving. 
The second component is selection. A question is asked and depending on the answer, the action changes. So most of the times you will have only two actions that you can get. Either it is true or false, yes or no. In, in these situations, you don't have a third option. And you can have selection only when you have options. You cannot choose between red and red. So if it, like if I give you uh, a card with two colors or then you have a choice of choosing which color you want, it can be red or green. But if I give you a card, both of red, there is no choice for you. You have to choose red. So when you have choices to make, that's when you use selections. So for example, here it says, start, the alarm goes off. Is it a weekday? Yes, so you get ready for school. Not at the moment, which is a happy thing. And if it's not a weekday, then you snooze and go back to sleep, which is what we do sometimes, even if it's a weekday. So, so you use selection when you have choices to make in your algorithm. Here's an example of uh, finding out whether a particular given bird or an animal belongs to what type of vertebra, okay? Let's say you have mammals, you have birds, you have reptile, you have amphibian and your fish, right? So they're all categorized by different characteristics or properties as we call them. For example, the birds lays eggs, they're warm blooded, they have feathers. Now, if I give a seagull, you should be able to tell me, you, you, you should be able to ask me questions like, does it produce milk? Does it give birth to, li um, to live young animal? Is it warm blooded? And if I say yes to all of those, you would say it's a mammal. But if I say no to one of these, for example, if you ask me it's a warm blooded, now it could be a mammal, it could be a bird. Now, among these two, how will you know whether the next question should be dependent on whether it's producing milk or, or lay eggs? You can say, does it have feathers? So if that is the case, you can say it's a bird. So things like that. So you gave options. Here's an example. So you start, then let's say, for example, we say, I'm thinking of snakes. So we we'll go from start, does it lay eggs? Yes, it does. And is it cold blooded? Yes, it is. Does it have scales? Yes, it does. Does it live in water? The one I have thought of doesn't. So it's a reptile. This is a very simple solution to be honest because not you cannot categorize every single animal in this flowchart. This is a very, very simplistic example. You have snakes that live in water and you have uh, uh, animals which, which are uh, bordering between a mammal and a bird and dogfish. Is it a fish or is it amphibian? I mean, what is it? Is it a mammal? What is it? So you have a lot of things that cross these boundaries. So for that, your flowchart should be more extensive in nature. So this is only for simplistic categories because the more you learn in biology, the more complicated it becomes. Not that uh, it's difficult, it's just complicated. The third one is iteration. So iteration is where you keep doing something again and again. So the first pass of doing a particular thing, like for example, you when you were going to school, you get up, you get ready, you go to school, attend school, come back, do your homework or go for play and then come back. So and then you repeat for five days a week. So that, so a, each day is an iteration. You do all the things that you need to do for like start from, from uh, getting up to going back to sleep is a whole iteration for a day. And then you repeat it for five days. So we do that in computer science or in, in programming in computational thinking too, even in algorithms, because we do have to repeat some steps again and again. Most programs do have a con uh, sorry do have a set of instructions that are executed over and over. We use loops for that because we do it again and again. Uh, let us uh, uh, take this example of a traffic light. Let's say this is a traffic light where there is no pedestrian crossing whatsoever. So it starts from red then it turns to red and amber, then goes to green, then turns to amber and then goes to red. So, and this keeps going on and on. So the first 
iteration is going to be red, red, amber, green, and amber. So that is one iteration. After that, it loops back. So it keeps doing this forever. It never stops. If you want to extend this and say, I'm going to add a pedestrian crossing, then you might have to add a condition. So you'll have a selection saying that if the pedestrian light button is pushed, then you have to stop at red for a longer time than you would and then enable the pedestrian lights to switch on and off. So things can be extended. So in this simple example, you don't. It's just these four lights that keeps going on forever. So this is the flow chart uh, or, or the set of steps that you would do for the traffic lights. Now, we will talk about flowchart shortly. So this is an example of how you can use selections in real life, for example. You are like when you're logging into any web system, for example, Amazon or Apple, any 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 web application. If you have an account, you'll be asked for your username and password. And if you provide the correct password, then you'll be logged in. If you don't provide the correct password, you'll be asked again to do it. So what they do have is they have sequence, they have selection, and they have iteration in that particular problem. How? So you, you have a sequence of you start, you enter the password, and then you do something. So all these are sequence. Now, where does a selection come in? You check if the password entered is correct or not. So that is a selection. So you can have only yes or no. If it is yes, you're happy, and we welcome them to the page. And we stop but if no then you you tell them that the password is incorrect and you keep going back to enter the password we do not actually stop until they enter the right password so the page is still on and keeps asking for the password until you provide them so that so that is a iteration so this is one iteration enter password password correct no enter it again so that is one iteration and then it goes on forever until they enter the right password. So you see all the three components of the, uh, um, the algorithms implemented in this simple problem. Subroutines. So if you have all the three main components, what is a subroutine? We talked about pattern matching and we said there can be a um, set of tasks which are similarish in nature, which may have things that you need to commonly solve, part of it at least, and then use it in all those tasks. When that happens, we use something called subroutines to implement or to do that common task. Uh, it's a sequence of instructions that perform a, a specific task and you can reuse it or use a task in a lot of other problems or tasks. So we have a input and we have a subroutine. So this subroutine is done separately. This is a subtask of a task. And then we come back after the once the subroutine is done, we come back to the main one and then we finish the task. For example, if someone wants to calculate the cube volume, what we do is we ask the side length and then we call a subroutine which doesn't do anything else. It all it knows is that it has to do it. So if I give the subroutine a value saying 10, it has to do a cube of the 10 and return me the value that is all it should do it has got nothing to do with any other problem because I might be doing the cube volume for my own benefit or as part of a bigger problem it doesn't have to know that so we have side let this three cube the volume which is the subroutine so it goes here start cube volume takes a side length and that's a cube of that then sets it to result and returns a result and comes back to this section here and then prints a result and ends the task. Let's take an example of a pizza flowchart which uses sequences, selection, iteration and subroutine. Here is an example. So if we start, again, we are not making the pizza from the beginning. We are using a, pre, a frozen pizza here. So we start. We get an oven tray and place a pizza or chips in the oven tray. Then we preheat the oven to appropriate temperature shown in the packaging. 
put tray with pizza or chips inside the oven. So, so far, we are on all of these are sequences. Then we look at the recommended cooking time in packaging. Then put a timer on. So, timer on now is a subroutine. So, it comes here to start the timer. Wait until the designated time limit. Turn on the alarm sound. Wait for two minutes or, or until the user turns it off. And then turn the alarm off and stop the timer. So, this is separate in terms of this but it's still part of the solution so the timer sub subroutine can be executed on its own but it's of no use until we make it part of the pizza cooking solution and then once the time is done we check if the food is done if it is not done then we keep it in the oven for a few more minutes and then we keep checking if the food is done. If it is done, then take out the pizza and have a nice pizza for lunch or dinner. And you end. So you see that you have got selection. You've got some routines. You have got an iteration over here because you keep checking if the food is done. So you've got all of the four in this one solution. There are two different... Now we have seen actually four components of an algorithm, there are two ways of representing it. One is a pseudocode, the other is a flowchart, which we have seen. So all these are flowcharts. A pseudocode. A pseudocode is a descriptive explanation. So I don't show you how it is using a, a, a diagram. I explain to you step by step. I uh, So I use English language or English-like language to explain what the first step is, what the second step is, what the third step is. If there is a condition, I write it in English saying if this is set or if the timer is done, then do this, else do that. So things like that. And you have WJAC conventions to explain to you how to write a pseudocode. And flowchart. A flowchart is a diagrammatic representation of an algorithm. We're not going in depth in this exercise about um, sort of corner flowchart in this video, uh, but we will look at that in another video later. Again, it uses specific symbols like a parallelogram for input output, a process which is used uh, which uses a rectangle, then you have a rounded rectangle for start and stop, you have a subroutine. So it actually tells, if, if, if a user looks at a particular flowchart, they will be able to tell what a particular shape does without even them having been told about it. So that's the end of our first video. Uh, in the second video, we will look at some of the sorting and searching algorithms. So we have learned about what an algorithm is, how it fits with the bigger picture of a computational thinking process and now we will see some examples of those algorithms in the next one.